Hi, I am Håkon Fossen. I'm professor at the University of Bergen, Norway, Structural Geology and Tectonics. And uh, I'm going to talk about relatively basic aspects of shear zones. Shear zones are really interesting structures and uh, there is a lot, there's so much that could be said about shear zones that uh, in this presentation we'll just stick to the relatively basic stuff and then you can find other information elsewhere on this website and other websites and in, in the literature that if you want to dig into um, some of the details. So first of all, what is a shear zone really? Well, a shear zone is a zone of higher deformation, higher strains than what you find in the wall rocks on each side. So it's actually a high strain zone. You know, the wall rocks can be unformed, deformed, but then they have to be less deformed than the shear zone. And this deformation in the wall rock can be earlier or even simultaneous with the deformation in the shear zone. But there has to be a significant difference in strain. So that's how that's defined. The shear zone itself can involve uh, all kinds of deformations in terms of coaxiality. It could be simple shear, it could be pure shear, combination of the two, uh, transgression. That's not part of the definition of the shear zone. That's more specific information about the shear zone that is important. But a shear zone is just a high strain zone. And you can see that on this picture, this person is standing on on rocks that have a stronger fabric than the wall rocks and the red lines here kind of outlines. The shear zone in this case, this picture is from Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil. So we're talking about strain localization, which is a process producing shear zones, as opposed to distributed diffuse deformation in the crust. And shear zones form, of course, in, in all kinds of tectonic regimes, in the extensional regime, strike slip, and contractional regimes. Um, that's, shear zones are basically everywhere in the middle and lower crust, which is illustrated in, in this figure, which appear in many different varieties. So if we have a fault, big fault at the surface, so there's a good chance it will transition into a shear zone at depth through what's called the brittle plastic or brittle ductile transition. And usually a shear zone is considered to be wider, especially deep down, than the corresponding fault in the upper brittle crust. One of the fascinating uh, aspects of shear zones is that they can occur on very uh, different scales. This picture to the left is a micro scale <coughs> showing a shear zone of about half a centimeter of offset. And the, on the, the picture to the right is the Great Slave Lake shear zone, which shows about 500 kilometers of offset. But they look fairly similar in terms of structure. Uh, we'll come back to that, but that's, that's fascinating. And if we were to the Himalayan alpine collisional system, we see that the kind of the edges of the Himalayan segment uh, look like shear zones. We could put some arrows on this, uh, this uh, illustration. And if we look in more detail, we can see somewhat smaller structure, smaller scale structures that also seem to be shear zones. Let's look at the eastern part of the system. We zoom in there, we can see smaller shear zones and uh, networks zoom in one of those we can see that that con con consists of smaller scale structures again and we can go continue all the way down to the outcrop scale like a thin section and look at the microstructures shear zone structures and even go into individual crystals and look at the the intracrystalline crystalline deformation uh, that is related to the shearing in this zone so this large range in scales from the really really large structures down to the microscopic uh, even the nanoscale structures is is fascinating and part of uh, the study of shear zones to look at these things now the really large shear zones 
uh, appeared to be able to cut through the entire crust and even through the upper, the lithospheric mantle. Uh, there are geophysical data that indicate exactly this. For example, this figure shows um, a simplified picture based on the San Andreas Fault in California, where the green, uh, dark green lines indicate um, the fabric in the shear zone, which is relatively steep, probably in, in this case with a steep, steep structure. This figure here to the right shows um, how this works with uh, shear waves. So when you have this anisotropy created by shear zones, the idea is that the shear waves will have different velocities in different directions. Uh, it basically splits into two orthogonal uh, directions or shear waves, one traveling faster, that would be along the shear zone, and one traveling slower than the other. You can plot this on, on maps if you have this kind of data. And the map I chose here is to the left, one from um, Scotland, where the yellow direction here is the, the fast direction. So we see the fast direction changes from uh, kind of northwest, west, northwest, uh, south, southeast. Um, to the north and along the main, the main thrust, the main thrust, and then it changes and rotates to become parallel to the Great Glen Fault, which is this structure here. And that may be exactly because the Great Glen Fault, as it appears on the surface, uh, becomes a shear zone with steep fabrics uh, that influence uh, the um, shear wave fast direction. Shear zones can be classified in different ways. We can have single versus networks. We can have shear zones that widen with a constant thickness, thinning shear zones. We can have ductile brittle, we can have plastic brittle, and so on. So I um, have this figure here. Uh, for faults, we have you know, brittle faults. We know that brittle faults link up and form these kind of um, network structures and astomorphic networks uh, as indicated in this figure for a dextral um, sense of uh, displacement. So a shear zone, we find similar things in shear zones. We find that they contain smaller scale strain localization structures that link up and form, form these kind of network uh, asymmetric in a non-coaxial zone, if we look at a more coaxial system for faults, we get tend to get conjugate systems. And for shear zones, we get something similar. The angles are different, but we get more symmetric um, networks. So difference between non-coaxial, kind of simple shear influenced and, and, and coaxial um, networks seem to be be present. Then we have the change in width. So an interesting question regarding shear zones relates to the way that they change thickness or not during strain accumulation. Do they thicken, do they thin, or do they remain constant? So this, this illustration here, this little, little animation shows an example of a shear zone that maintains its thickness. So the thickness is always the same. The strain increases. Here's one that thickens. T1 is time one, T2, time two, T3, a later point during the evolution of the shear zone. And we see that it becomes wider and wider, which makes uh, sense in many ways. But we could also imagine a shear zone where strain localization continues and we localize strain over time to the central part of the shear zone. Just two examples. The results are quite different in terms of strain distribution. So that's another way of classifying or separating different types of shear zones. We'll get back to that. 
Shear sounds are, by definition, ductile or predominantly ductile structures. And uh, although there are some different opinions about this, ductile generally means that originally continuous markers remain continuous throughout and after the deformation. So ductile deformation doesn't really imply a specific deformation mechanism at the micro scale, it just means that uh, continuity is preserved in terms of uh, layers. Hence, sedimentary layers may deform in a ductile way at surface conditions, for, for example, during mass flow, uh, slumping or sliding. Shear zones that show a component of brittle structures where layers are partly disrupted can be called brittle ductile shear zones. And faults are, at the other end, they are generally brittle in style, meaning that previous continuous layers have been cut off, disrupted. But fault drag, which is very common among faults, represents a component of ductile deformation uh, among these faults. So that's ductility, ductile brittle style of deformation. If we look at deformation mechanisms, which we're not going to talk much about, we distinguish between brittle and plastic or crystal plastic deformation mechanisms. Plastic deformation mechanisms, such as dislocation creep, recrystallization, and so on, result in ductile deformation. Many shear zones contain minerals that deform in different ways. For example, brittle feldspars may occur in a framework of plastically deforming quartz grains. As only at high, very high temperatures is the deformation completely crystal plastic for the all the minerals in the shear zones. Very often there is there's some brittle deformation uh, of, of, indivi of individual grains like feldspar. And we have two transitions in this diagram here that illustrates this. The first one for quartz um, at around 300 degrees centigrade when quartz starts to behave in a crystal plastic uh, manner. That's the first black thick line in this diagram and then the lower one is the transition for feldspar which occurs at higher temperature somewhere between 450 and maybe closer to 500 degrees. So, this plastic brittle transition, of course, depends on the mineralogy of the rock that we are looking at. And also some other things like fluid, uh, presence of fluids and, and strain rate. Here's an example. This is um, a shared um, dike with some large uh, crystals that consists of feldspar and the feldspar has fractured very nicely in many small fractures. It, it's behaving in a brittle way. But it's a, it's a ductile shear zone, it's a plastic shear zone because the quartz, which is kind of bluish in this rock, is deforming in a crystal plastic way, plastic way with crystal plastic deformation mechanisms. So this is kind of the framework that controls deformation. But there is a strong component of brittle deformation mechanisms too in this ductile shear zone. So, shear zone initiation and growth. I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. And uh, one important thing in this context is that no rock is homogeneous. There is always heterogeneity, some kind of flaws in, in the rock that are important for the initiation of shear zones, just as it is for, for fault initiation. Because deformation initiates on pre-existing flaws or relatively weak structures um, in general. And at the large scale, we can have thermal weakening, local higher temperatures locally, or maybe um, fluids being more uh, present locally, that could be important. 
and once strain localizes, then strain softening may keep the formation localized so that you develop the shear zone. That's the simple idea. Strain softening in the plastic machine may be caused by dynamic recrystallization uh, in the new forming shear zone. The recrystallization generally involves grain size reduction, which is an important aspect of, of this localization. And we can have metamorphic phase changes, for example, potassium feldspar being uh, altered into to micas, which are much weaker minerals. And we can have hydrothermal alteration, hydrolytic weakening, where water molecules uh, concentrate on grain boundaries uh, and, and so on. And we can, uh, so, so in this case, water on grain boundaries reduces the intercrystalline uh, rock strength, facilitating dissolution, precipitation, and accelerating grain boundary migration and grain boundary sliding kind of recrystallization mechanisms. And then we can have shear heating, locally increasing the temperature due to uh, kinematic movements and even melting in some cases. If you form melt in the shear zone, and then of course it's going to be very weak and deformation would love to continue right there in this uh, shear zone. In the brittle regime, we also have strain softening. It's very rapid because you form non-cohesive fractures and slip surfaces, grain size reduction also in the brittle regime by cataclases in this case, growth of clay and other plate and minerals, formation of continuous mechanical discontinuities or sounds of discontinuities, elevated fluid pressures, pressure and, and cementation, pressure solution, on the other hand can harden faults again. Um, so there are parallels between faults and uh, shear zones, but also some differences. Let's look at shear zone initiation a little bit more. How does a shear zone initiate kind of form? How is it born? So we, we, we tend to think about rocks as something homogeneous, like this picture here looks fairly homogeneous, but there's always some kind of mineral alignment, some kind of weakness some kind of heterogeneities that can localize strain where you know where you start to form the shear zone and and soon you have a shear zone there still at a very small scale centimeter scale in this case um, we see if we look around we can find many cases where we have uh, veins and shear zones initiated initiating on or Long, uh, uh, within veins. This is a vein that has been transformed into epidote-rich uh, band. We can see this, how the shear is concentrated to this, this vein with a pre-existing foliation above and, and below swinging into this, this shear zone. There can be fractures, fractures that uh, develop into shear zones. Here's an example. This fracture actually formed at uh, relatively quite deep in the crust. And uh, we see how this fracture, if we look around in this, this area of the lower crust, how it develops. There, there's a metamorphic transition going on. Uh, and uh, we look around, we find that these fractures develop into shear zones where a lot more like this, which is a typical shear zone with uh, where you can trace the pre-existing foliation more continuously into the shear zone. Here's an example of a shear zone nucleating along the margin of a dike, a granitic dike in a kind of granitic rock in the Alps, taken from the literature. And we see a very strong concentration of strain from the fabric development along the, the margin of the dike. So pre-existing uh, heterogeneity in form of dike uh, wall rock interface. 
And here's an example from the hot lower middle crust where we have actual melt forming. Uh, and along these melts, there seems to have been shear, so they actually uh, form shear zones. It's very easy for shearing to occur along these bands that contain melts. This one is from from uh, uh, the northeast of Brazil. We're going to go back to this um, aspect of shear zones that relate to um, scale. Some shear zones are, or many aspects of shear zones, are scale independent. Now that means that sizes such as thickness and displacement they change at the same at some some kind of fixed proportion. When you, when you increase, for example, the thickness or length of a shear zone, you increase the thickness or the displacement or so on. So this picture shows a small matchbox car. This car is not a real car. It's just a very small, few centimeters long car. But it could almost have been a real car. In this. The, the as, many aspects of shear zones are scale independent. And we can, we can go back to this, these two pictures. So the picture to the left here is microscopic scale picture from a thin section showing a shear, a shear zone in sand. This is an example of a ductile shear zone where we can trace the layering lamination across the shear zone and without any interruption, any rupture. So it's a ductile shear zone in the brittle regime. And the one to the right is the Great Slave Lake shear zone with hundreds of kilometers. So again, if it wasn't for the scale bar and some of the features, the structure of this, these two shear zones is very, very similar. And uh, for example, thickness versus the ratio between thickness and uh, displacement is more or less the same. Let's see here. If we put, if we define the shear zone something like this, we can plot, for example, the thickness of the shear zones against the offset. And if we do that for many different shear zones, at least some shear zones, here is a diagram showing the relationship between thickness, the thickness of the shear zone, and the displacement of that same shear zone for some data from various shear zones at various scales. And we see that comparing small, relatively small scale shear zones and large scale shear zones, there is a we can we can kind of see a general trend that the thicker the shear zone, the higher the displacement. And there's quite a bit of variation here though. For example, a thickness of one meter a shear zone with thickness of one meter could have a thickness, a displacement of uh, 10 times the thickness would be kind of an average, it seems, but it, it can vary from by two orders of magnitude. It could have uh, the same displacement as the thickness or 100 times. Uh, that's kind of the variation, at least, that we see. But in general, there is a trend. The thicker the shear zone, the higher the displacement. The, does that mean that shear zones kind of gradually widen as they grow? Not necessarily. We'll get back to that. Let's just look at how the thickness of a shear zone can vary over time. Here we will look at some, some very theoretical examples of shear zone growth, where we look at um, displacement, where we look at thickness variations. Um, there is something called <coughs> type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, based mainly on uh, some work by wind means from from uh, several decades ago. Let's look at the first type, type one. Uh, to the left here, we have a shear zone uh, nucleating and it grows. Uh, uh, it becomes thicker, time one, T1, uh, T2, T3. At T3, it's become uh, much thicker. The dark fields in this diagram, black, uh, indicate the active part of the shear zone. So 
it the activity always occurs along or close to the two margins. The diagram below shows the distribution of shear strain uh, in this um, zone, which also means the distribution of displacement, as we will get back to. And uh, it developed into kind of a flat, a uh, little bit plateau-like uh, distribution over time. Below that we find the thickness of the shear zone, the blue arrow going up, increase in thickness over time or displacement. And uh, the active thickness is different here at the bottom. Uh, once the, the shear zone is established, the active thickness is more or less constant because the activity is always along the margins irrespective of, of, of the total thickness of the shear zone. So that could be one type of, of ideal or reference type of shear zone evolution that would cause shear zones to widen over time as displacements and shear strain accumulates. A strain hardening, let's see. And then we have type 2. Now this is quite different. In this case we have a shear zone established uh, and then the activity localizes to the central part of the shear zone for some reason, some kind of weakening going on there. And we get a very peak-like uh, shear strain distribution and also displacement distribution. Total thickness becomes constant. Uh, it's always the same after some time. And uh, the active thickness becomes smaller and smaller because of the localization to the central part of the shear zone. A strain softening due to, could be many reasons for strain softening. We already talked about some of that. Then there's type three, where the shear zone thickness is always the same, constant thickness. And the shear zone is always, I mean, it's active everywhere. Deformation is going on, strain is accumulating everywhere in the shear zone at any point in time. And you get this very plateau uh, type of um, shear strain distribution. The second uh, figure from the top. And the thickness is the same as the active, the total thickness the same as the active thickness. So that's type three. And we could imagine a type four where the shear zone increases in thickness and is always active everywhere in the shear zone is everywhere active and we'll get this kind of uh, distribution of shear strain and thickness and active thickness both increase over time as shown here so these are just some kind of idealized shear zone growth models it could be uh, interesting we can see differences between these in terms of displacement distribution, shear strain distribution, uh, and, but they're just idealized models. Uh, in nature we can, think, we can think of much more complicated evolutions. So here is um, an example of small scale shear zones. This is taken from a paper by Ramsey and Allison. And uh, the interesting thing is we're looking at the same rock, it's kind of magmatic granitic, granitic rock, and these are shear zones at more or less the same scale, they have more or less similar lengths, but they have quite different thicknesses. You can see that this shear zone to the left is very thin, then this shear zone C uh, is also very, very thin, uh, seems to have similar displacement, similar length to, the, to B and D at least, but much thinner. B is very wide, the strain is very widely distributed. This just illustrates, I'm showing you this just to illustrate that shear zones are a little bit complicated. They, they do things that may be controlled by factors that are not so easy to observe, whether it's small scale heterogeneities, there's something about fluid infiltrations at the time of deformation, or other things. We need to understand these processes much better at the small scale and large scale. Here's another interesting diagram showing some of the properties of shear zones uh, from a paper by Benajoni. 
2005, where we can see a relationship between the length of the shear zones and the displacement. I mean, the, the length is plotted here. Each of these curves represents uh, data from one shear zone, measuring mm -hmm. um, displacement from one tip to the other at different stations. And they show exactly what faults show an increase in displacement toward the central part of the shear zone and then displacement fades off again toward the other tip. So these are different shear zones of different lengths and the longer they are the higher the displacement. And we can plot this data in a graph directly plotting the maximum displacement along the vertical axis here, the maximum values of these curves in the left side diagram against their length. And we see a very nice uh, relationship in log-log space uh, indicated here for a particular data set. Very similar, at least uh, qualitatively, to, to faults, to the way that faults behave in terms of displacement and length. And we can plot this data. This is the same data here with some additional data in black plotted in a linear diagram in the small um, graph in this uh, slide. And uh, we see this linear trend it can be expressed in a linear by a linear regression line. Put it into this log log diagram, the large diagram here. These are different fault uh, data. Uh, over a large range of lengths and, dis and displacements, maximum displacements. And in these, these green dots uh, in this diagram, the squares are the data we've been looking at from shear zones. We need more data like this from, from shear zones. The trend here, the black line, is a little bit different from many fault populations. Although individual populations over a limited range of lengths can, can have a steeper um, uh, regression line than, than the, the population, the global population. Not so different from faults. Talking about faults, there's another interesting thing about faults that seem to, to um, transfer over spill over to, to shear zones and that's the way that faults grow. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the growth of shear zones. So if we look at faults, there's just some, some pictures from a beach experiment here. We have two faults to the right. The, the red faults at time T1 are isolated at least at the surface. On the surface here we have these two, two um, so-called underlapping faults in the picture, upper picture to the right and they start to overlap in the picture in the photo to the right B and that would correspond to time T2, the orange segments in the drawing to the left and they, as they overlap they start to interfere, the, the strain and stress fields start to interfere and we at some point we get a relay ramp and then we get a continuous fault because the two segments link up, we get a hard link, and we form a new fault that is much longer than the first one with some irregularity. And at the bottom left we see the displacement evolution to individual faults in red, then linking up and forming a continuous displacement profile with a maximum in the central part of much longer fault. We do this, these kind of experiments easily, for example, with a plaster. This is from um, a plaster experiment where we pull, it's a box, a seam from above, we pull the lower the end of the box and extend this plaster and we see individual small faults and drawings to the right uh, illustrate the, the small faults forming at the top here, F1, F2, and many small 
faults that link up and form a continuous much longer fault with much larger displacement. So it's not about a single fault um, propagating in all directions, growing bigger and bigger. It's about many small individual faults linking up to form a much longer fault with a larger displacement. And this may be a parallel to shear zones too, especially where shear zones initiate as uh, brittle fractures, like in this case here from the Alps, again from Penatroni's uh, paper 2005, where he mapped uh, platic dikes in red, and then these, these uh, kind of brittle features that evolve, evolve into shear zones. And if we look at what happens here is these, uh, these features, they are not straight, they are irregular. And I put some, some pink uh, circles around some interesting features. Let's zoom in a little bit. Here we go. Uh, maybe even more. We can see how these, these um, um, black lines representing uh, shear zones uh, kind of have very irregular shapes, some straight segments and sometimes then some abrupt changes in orientation. And these are places, these jogs are places where the uh, early features linked up to form much longer features. So uh, shear zones can form in this way, can become much longer uh, simply by, by connecting uh, through linkage. This is a completely ductile um, plastic shear zone system from uh, Carreras uh, and others, 2010. Uh, and again, we can imagine, I mean, if you look at this uh, nestomosing system of shear zones, we can imagine that these were individual small elements that, that linked up to form this more complex network of shear zones. And you can now trace can go from one side of the picture to the other continuously along shear zones, but they are not straight, they are very irregular. So we are forming a network of shear zones that would become uh, in a total a much, much longer shear zone. And this is how we can, very, in very simple terms, imagine how this shear zone, uh, shear zones can grow from at the top here, figure A, very small segments that interact and link up. In B, we have some linkage. C, we have more. And D, we have very, very uh, uh, mature, developed system of, uh, of linked, interlinked shear zone elements. And now you can call the whole thing uh, a shear zone if you want to. And we see these kind of features at various scales. At the top here, there's drawing uh, from Cup de Cruz, where we see exactly these kind of irregular shear zone patterns. Uh, and at the bottom, it's actually an area magnetic map of part of the northeast of Brazil, very large scale. Um, the central shear zone is the Patos shear zone, has a thickness of at least 10 kilometers. And we see the same kind of system of anastomos and curving um, shear zone elements forming a much larger um, shear zone system, if you like. So this is a very important feature of shear zone growth. This is linking, linkage, the process of individual elements linking up to form a much larger system and a much larger shear zone. This is an example from seismic data showing a possible uh, kind of uh, um, anastomos and shear zone system of the lower crust in the passive margin. And the, the upper figure shows uh, the, seism the deep seismic line and is the Moho. This is from Clerk and others, 2015. And the crust is thinning from the left to the right. At some point, we probably get oceanic crust. 
uh, in that transition, there is uh, there are reflections that uh, are shown, interpreted in B and C. C is a detail uh, from from B, and these um, features form geometrically a network that looks looks very much like a shared zone uh, system, system of shared zones. And at the base, there are some examples of what the seismic actually looks like. So we can use this, uh, this idea to try also to interpret seismically or uh, interpret shear zones from reflection seismic data. There seems to be quite a few of these shear zones, especially in the lower part of the crust. Now back to this figure. So again, there is this difference probably between coaxial and non-coaxial deformation where non-coaxial deformation, the lower left, produces uh, asymmetric anastomosing systems of shear zones where you can, the asymmetry actually is related to the sense of, of shear. Whereas in the coaxial network, coaxial um, strain field, we would expect these um, you also have the same process of linkage of individual shear zone segments, but you will probably form a more symmetric um, pattern of individual shear zone elements like, like we see in the lower right figure. And also a difference between these two, if you look at individual lenses in these two coaxial versus non-coaxial systems, uh, you would probably find that they show a different kinematic pattern conjugate pattern, a conjugate setting is the one to the left here, where you get um, um, kind of a symmetric um, displacement distribution, whereas in the anastomose and non-coaxial system you get the same sense of shear all along the surface of these, uh, these pods or these lenses in the shear zones. Kinematics are different. Now we're going to talk about simple shear zones, how to extract information from shear zones that we can assume are more or less simple in terms of uh, shear, in terms of strain, simple shear deformation. Look at strain and displacement distributions in these uh, shear zones, how we can say something about that. These are very ideal simple shear zones, simple shear deformation zones. They were explored by John Ramsey. It's a very useful thing to do, but just be aware that this is probably a simplification of the actual uh, most natural shear zones, I would say. But very useful. So we can see already here the shear zone kind of model straight walls. Let's look at the next figure straight walls, parallel walls, constant thickness to so move laterally, not over time, but geometrically in, in space, undeformed wall rock or wall rocks that have been deformed previously, not during this deformation. And here's that matrix, the, the transformation matrix, the deformation matrix that describes simple shear. It's also useful to know. So what happens here, we see a foliation in this zone. This foliation is not straight, it's curving to become more parallel to the shear zone in the central part where the strain is higher. And this is animation shows how this foliation can evolve in this shear zone. You see the margins are always parallel. The thickness is always constant. The shear zone is growing in this case. And the strain is higher in the central part. The foliation shows a rotation from the margins to the central part. Let's look at that end result. Here is our shear zone and uh, we can see the foliation quite well. Um, starting at about 45 degrees along the margins and, and the angle to the shear zone getting lower and lower toward the central part of the shear zone. That's exactly what is illustrated in the graph at the top. And this 
ellipse, strain ellipse, developing at the very top the animation. The angle between the long axis of the strain ellipse and the shear zone is always decreasing during deformation, during strain accumulation. And this decrease is illustrated in this graph, the red line, starting at 45 degrees. That's where, where the foliation starts, more or less close to 45 degrees at least. And decreasing as gamma along the horizontal axis, the shear strain increases. We could also plot the, the ratio between the long and short axis along the horizontal axis. So um, the shear zone thickness is shown here. It's always uh, it's the same along the shear zone, but it can change over time. Under from wall rock, we have a coordinate system that is uh, can be um, oriented like this, parallel to the shear zone. The z-axis perpendicular to the shear zone. And here are the strain ellipses. So the strain is higher in the central part of the shear zone. And therefore, the foliation has a lower angle to the shear zone, makes a lower angle uh, uh, in uh, agreement with this, uh, this graph here. And you can actually, um, by looking at the strain and the orientation of the strain ellipse, you can say something about the, the, the shear strain, the displacement, and so on. And here's again the evolution of the strain ellipse. If we have a circle, the white circle at the bottom here, it will evolve from an initial early orientation close to 45 degrees, axis, the long axis of the strain ellipse, and then it will decrease and get closer and closer to the shear plane as deformation proceeds. Here is um, um, basically the same graph in blue now, the graph we just looked at, the foliation, the angle here along the vertical axis between the foliation or the long axis of the strain ellipse, which we correlate with the foliation and the shear zone, decreasing from, from 45 degrees. And then we have another graph in this kind of, another curve in the same graph, and that's plotting R, which is the ratio between x and z, the long and short axis of the, of the strain ellipse. And this is going to start out at zero and increase the ratio increasing as, as strain, as uh, deformation proceeds. Or as we go from the margin to the central part of the shear zone. So these three parameters are all related. And here is a relationship between the shear strain to the left, the formula to the left. The shear strain is two, time, um, two over the tangent to two times that angle between the foliation and the shear zone, which you can turn around this formula if you want. So you can find um, well, um, sh the shear strain, or you can find the angle between the foliation and the and the, the margin if you want. At the bottom here, the right, there is an example of shear zone showing um, amygdales and there's a lava, a metamorphic lava that has been sheared. The shear strain is in the lower part. And we can see how these uh, light objects are being strained more and more and as they come, become more parallel to the shear zone at the bottom. As we deform the rock in the shear zone, we uh, get, I mean, the, the rock itself changes. I mean, we have an originally undeformed rock like this one, and uh, then we apply some strain, okay, then we get a strain, and we can see the elliptical shapes of these uh, large uh, mega crests in this uh, magmatic rock changing their shape, becoming parallel. And then the next stage, more strain, they become more, more uh, the, the aspect ratio between the long and short axis becomes higher and even higher 
now it's starting to become difficult to uh, to measure the ratio of the long over the short axis and we can go on and end up with with rocks like this one it's from from uh, shear zone in uh, in the east northeast of brazil very 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 strongly deformed and it's impossible to to see any shape anymore and this foliation is almost parallel to the shear zone and if we want we can use this spreadsheet that you can find on my website the address is in the top on the top of the slide to the right we put in gamma values and you can find values for r and the uh, this angle here to the right theta uh, the angle between the long axis of the strain lips and the shear zone which changes from close to 45 degrees down as shear strain to the right to the left here in red in increases this value goes down and you can make this plot for example that is shown here that we talked about so you can use this this um the spreadsheet to to play around with these things now the good thing the nice thing about these relations and these formulas is if you know the orientation of the foliation you can find uh, the shear strain gamma and you can from that also find the displacement assuming simple shear here's how that works you um, make a profile line across your shear zone from a to b and then you measure the the shear strain and the shear strain curve maybe something like this there is a and b at the bottom graph and the shear strain increases toward the center of the shear zone let's see how that works the, the area under this curve is represents the the displacement and here is an example of how we can do this here is a shear zone a photo of the shear zone or a small shear zone it runs from left to right here more or less horizontally across the picture and we can trace the foliation use these two profiles to illustrate this this uh, method and we use that formula that is shown below the, the photo here to find gamma from the orientation of the foliation measuring the angle between the shear zone and the foliation theta prime and based on that we can construct this graph there's gamma plotted along the horizontal axis in this case and then in centimeters the uh, distance along the profile and then we calculate the area uh, below this graph and, and here is the result of that this, we see the two graphs we count the number of squares these squares are Called units here they are half a centimeter in length and in height and one gamma in length so we have to have two of those to get a centimeter we find that the area here corresponds to eight centimeters of displacement 8.4 in the right B profile and that's how you find displacement from a shear zone just based on the orientation or the variation of foliation orientation across the shear zone without any marker or anything else that directly tells you the displacement alternatively you can you can plot the angular shear strain which is like the tangent to the ang angular shear strain is the is the shear strain so you just take the inverse tangent to the shear strain and you plot those orientations for the different points uh, across the shear zones that we defined and draw a continuous line along these uh, shear strain angular shear strain um, orientations then you get 
also the eight centimeters of offset that we found. So just that's a different way of doing that. So that's nice. We can map gamma and find the displacement for simple shear as just an illustration of how uh, displacement would increase for this theoretical shear zone that accumulates strain more strain in the central part than along the margins in this case. You get this kind of displacement diagram. You can also map also map the, uh, this, the shear strain within the shear zone based on the orientation of the foliation as shown here, a map of gamma for this particular shear zone that we've seen before in this presentation. And here are the different displacement uh, profiles A, B and C at the bottom uh, showing how those vary along the shear zone. So that's nice to be able to estimate displacement even if we don't have markers. Where we do have markers like this granitic dike crossing the shear zone and being affected by the shear zone, we can check our assumptions, we can check to see if our simple shear assumption holds. If the simple shear assumption holds, we should get the same estimate for deformation, for displacement in the two, by the two methods. Um, Pre-existing markers can also be used to estimate uh, variations in uh, shear strain. Here we are adding a marker to our shear zone. This marker is 90 degrees to the, to the shear zone, uh, at, outside of the shear zone, so it's been affected by the shear zone and rotates. And the rotation of markers like this, let's add, an, add another one just to make a little bit more complicated situation where the marker is not perpendicular to the shear zone. Um, of course, it's going to have a different orientation within the shear zone too. The shear strain can be calculated now as John Ramsey showed uh, at some point um, by this, this formula. And beta is now the, is the original orientation, the angle shown in this figure um, with between the, the marker and the shear zone and within the shear zone we, beta is going to change to beta prime so as we move across the shear zone this beta prime is going to change um, and our estimate for shear strain is going to change so you can you can map shear strain across the shear zone based on pre-existing markers that have been deflected by the shear zone. Here are the curves for these two cases. The angle with the shear zone, between the shear zone and the markers, is plotted along the vertical axis of the big graph, then gamma along the horizontal axis. And we also added here the angle to the beta prime the variation in um, the orientation of the strain ellipse, so you can compare those. Of course, there are many lines for different values of, of beta uh, that you can you can plot depending on, on based on this formula, depending on the orientation of your pre-existing marker. A pre-existing marker can also be a pre-existing foliation, uh, which is very common. Shear zone here affecting pre-existing foliation at Cap de Cruz in uh, northeastern Spain. And uh, the way that this uh, pre-existing foliation is deflected by the shear zone uh, can be used to make, uh, for example, a profile of gamma of the shear strain across the zone. You can, as we showed before, uh, calculate the displacement of the shear zone just based on that orientation, but then you have to use the formulas of the previous slides. Now there, are, there is much more to be said about shear zones. There is many more complications. We have definitely many shear zones that are not simple shear, and there is a whole world of uh, different 
possibilities are there that I'm not going to talk about now. We have something called non-steady state deformation that is also very important. Um, the, the deformation can change during uh, over time so that you maybe you start with simple shear and then you, you go into something more uh, general uh, shear that involves a coaxial component of deformation, for example. And it's often very difficult to know uh, the deformation history of shear zones. We can have 3D complications where shear zones interact, where you have lenses of less deformed rock or undeformed rock in the shear zone that creates local complications. Kinematics uh, is an important uh, field of study that relates to shear zones and all the microstructural aspects and rheology. So there's a lot of things to be learned about shear zones. But we're going to stop right here and I recommend having a look at the e-learning module, free e-learning module at this address uh, that goes through shear zones in a different way. And here's the list of references for this presentation. The upper two references are the ones that I've used the most in terms of using figures and, and things. And that's my book and a recent share zone review paper. Thank you very much.